You had a good weekend? Any big news from the weekend? Get married, have a baby. That's big news, right? Get married, have a baby. That's big news. No? Okay. All right. Well, let's. I don't think we did these quick tests here, so why don't we do these? How is a torque similar to a force? Which of these? The torque and force are exactly the same. I'll let you read it. How are a torque and a how is a torque similar to a force? I'll zoom in if you don't have your workbook yet. How is a torque similar to a force? Oh, guys, by the way, on the quizzes, since I drop your lowest quizzes, I don't do makeups. All right, so uh, just come come for theirs. How is a torque similar to a force? Feel free to ask your neighbor if you like. Let's verify your answer. I'll stop here in just a second. I'm going to stop at uh, 128, 128. Sorry, I know y'all don't need that much time, but... Okay, awesome. V is right. Uh, the torque changes the rotational motion, and the force changes the translational motion. Torques cause rotational motion. They cause things to go in a circle. One of your quiz questions was about that, right? That it causes things to move in a circle. Um, oh, let's see. What is the difference? This is sort of a middle school joke, so brace yourself. What is the difference between roast beef and pea soup? Anybody can roast beef. <laughs> All right. Torques are relevant in which type of motion? Which of these types of motion? Oscillatory, translational force, or rotational motion? Free to ask your neighbor, and I'm going to stop at uh, 25. 25 stopping. And you are awesome. That's right. Uh, D is right. It's rotational motion. Oscillatory motion, we'll talk about that. Did a lot of y'all put A? No. We should put C. Forced motion. Hmm. That's not really a thing. So, <laughs> uh, rotational motion. Torques cause things to move, to rotate, to move in a circle. Oscillatory motion, we're going to get to that when we get to sound and hearing. It's, you know, vibrations. All right? Um, so, we'll get to that. Translational motion means it moves in a straight line. Oh, what are, uh, what do you call senses helpers? Subordinate clauses. Do I know I wanted to be an English major, like when I was in college? Any of y'all ever change your major? I did it like three times. Like three times I did it. But, but, yep, that's about right. Um, all right, let's look at levers. We're going to do a little activity to look at levers. Uh, look at levers also in the human body. Levers are a type of simple machine. You probably talked about this in you know, high school or whatever. They allow a person to either increase a force, so take an input force and make it bigger, or increase a displacement. In fact, that's generally true for uh, most simple machines, with the exception of the pulley, uh, though you can use a pulley to increase a force, but just a single pulley, you just redirect the force. We're not going to talk about pulleys. We're going to talk about levers. You can use those to increase a force or increase a displacement. Um, you have three classes of levers. I give you some diagrams here. This is class one. This is class two. 
and then this is class three. They're all classified by whether their fulcrum, their load, or their resistance, or their effort is in the middle. So with the class one, the fulcrum is in between the effort and the resistance. With the class two, the fulcrum is at the end, and then you have the effort and the resistance here. And then with class three, the fulcrum, or excuse me, the uh, is the fulcrum's at the end, but the effort is now in the middle. All right. So if you can just sort of sketch these out again with class one. This is like your uh, your teeter totter. This is effort. This is resistance. Class two. This is like a wheelbarrow. There's your fulcrum. This is our resistance. This is our effort. And then class three. This is our effort. And this is our resistance here. All right. So know those three classes of levers. You'll see some questions where you have to, to look at those. Uh, now, we've already dealt with this a little bit. Let's consider the, the overhead machine press. They have this thing over the right center where you can put plates onto uh, onto this device, and then you sit there, and then you push on it. You know what I'm talking about? For an overhead. You can do this with free weights, but you can also use this machine, this plate-loaded machine, where you put the plates onto the, the device. This is a lever. What class of lever is this, by the way? If you look at this device, what class of lever is it? Let's do it as a quicker question. Is this lever, is it a first class, a second class, or a third class lever? A, B, or C? What is this lever? Is it a first, second, or a third class lever? And do you know who that lady is? That's my wife. Isn't she awesome? She is awesome. I just had her too. Is she awesome or not? Yeah. I else had her? Yeah. I know. Is she awesome or what? She likes you. She told me. All right. <laughs> All right, let's stop at uh, 40. Uh, is that right? Yeah, that is right. I notice my uh, resistance is right here. This is my resistance, and then this is my effort, and then this is my fulcrum. The fulcrum is just where it rotates, the axis of rotation. So that is a class two lever. Now let's think about this. I have this loaded up with a 25-pound plate, and I want to know what force is required to lift this if the load is 25 pounds. Now we've done this. Let's think about our, our torques problem. I have this thing, there's my axis of rotation. I have a weight equal to 25 pounds. And then I have to exert some force over here. And I want to know what that force is. All right, I want you to tell me, is this force, we'll do it as a quicker question, is it 100 pounds? Is it 50 pounds? Is it 25 pounds? Or is it 13 pounds? That is F, this force, what is it equal to? The force required to lift this overhead machine press, I have it loaded up with a 25-pound plate. We're assuming that the actual machine has no weight at all, that it's negligible. So estimate then, what is the force required for me to lift this? Is it going to be 100 pounds, 50 pounds, 25 pounds, or 13? That's just half a 25. You're thinking about your torques. Now, we did this before with the seesaw. You want to balance your torques. In order for this to happen, the torques caused by this force have to equal the torque caused by this force in order for you to lift it. It has to equal or just a little bit exceed that force. So is it 100, 50, 25, or 13 pounds? Well, we're a little bit all over the board here. She's standing. That's not how you're supposed to do it, but it's just to demonstrate that this is a lever. She knows how to do the overhead machine press. Because she's awesome. But okay. All 
All right, I'm going to stop at 1, 120, 120. These are the types of problems that you could see on your test. As I said, you would have some simple math. The output B, let's take a look, okay? So our force, torque, is equal to our force times the length of our moment arm, right? So I know that the torque caused by this force is going to have to equal the torque caused by this force. Let's call this distance R. And so this distance is going to be R divided by 2, roughly. It's about half the distance. All right? Um, so the force times R has to equal to the force, this is my effort, this is my resistance, times R divided by 2. Uh, I know that, see, my R's cancel there. And so my effort, then, is going to equal to my resistance force divided by 2. So what is the answer? It's not B, as many of you put. It's what? Well, what is the resistance force? It has what weight? 25 pounds. Right, it's going to be 13. I would ask this person to stand up. Are you sitting? No, I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I was joking. <laughs> I would never draw out a student. But good job, Dre. That's awesome. All right? So it's going to be 13. 25 pounds divided by 2. That's equal to 13 pounds. <laughs> okay? But know how to work these torque problems in order to figure out, you know, what is going to be the force required in order to exert this force on this simple machine. It's important because it comes up quite a bit, and we'll see later in the human body, as muscles exert forces on levers, there are lots of levers in the body, and as forces, as muscles exert forces on those levers, uh, sometimes your, your resistance force is very small, but your effort force is very big because you have a short moment arm, the value for R. Now, in this case, our moment arm is big. That's this distance, so we actually get a mechanical advantage, we call it, that means that I require less force to lift this bigger object. Only 13 pounds in order to lift, you know, a 25-pound plate. So next time you're in the rec center and you see one of those big guys and they load up like three 45-pound plates on those overhead machine press, you go over there and you tell them, you say, hey, this is a simple machine. Mechanical advantage, two. And that means you're only lifting like half the weight that you think you have on there. What a wimp you are. Okay? Don't say that to them because they have very fragile egos and you don't want to harm them in any way. Okay? Y'all could do that on a test. We'll see some more. And listen, a good way to, for you to practice is to look at the old test. Sometimes you'll see the exact same questions. Not always because I, I write new exams every time. But you'll definitely see the same material covered by those old tests. In the back of your workbook, there are some old exams from last, last semester. And then also on the course website, there's exams that go back as long as we've taught this class, which is several years. So you can see those old exams. That's a good place for you to practice for the exam, which is coming up not long from now, okay? Reading the book, practice the old exams, go through your notes. Now let's try these quick tests. This one on the left first. Consider these levers. The block is the, the block on each is the same mass. You know, this is your resistance force, and they have the same mass or the same weight as a consequence. And which requires the most force to hold the block up as shown, moving our fulcrum around to different points. What is this lever? What class? One, two, or three? It's the class one lever, right? When the fulcrum's in the middle, that's a class one. Like a seesaw. A seesaw is a class one lever. All right. Um, I'm going to stop here at one minute. Go on to the one on the right if you haven't already. So let's look at the answer here. Oh, my goodness. You people. 
Uh, that's right. That's right. Hey, what do you call cheese that doesn't belong to you? Oh, come on. You don't give away my uh, nacho cheese. Don't do that. I, I don't like that. I'm smiling, but inside I'm frowning. I'm very unhappy about it. <laughs> Seriously, don't, don't get away with my All right. Uh, label each of these lever levers as either first, second, or third class. And then pick the correct order there. All right, I'm going to stop at uh, 35, 35. Good job. A is right. Um, this is a class 3 lever. This is a class 2 lever. This is a class 1 lever. Um, you can sort of think about this, I think, Probably the easiest way to keep this sorted in your mind is how the effort, cha how the resistance changes. See how the resistance goes across like that. But you just sort of have to sort it out. Maybe you can think of examples that are class one, two, or three. Like I always remember this is a seesaw. And then class two and three, man, I just always get them confused up what they are. So in your mind, be able to sort them out because you likely will have to identify those levers either in something like this or in the human body as either first, second, or third class. Make a note card, I guess. That's what I do. And paste it to your refrigerator. But so before we move on to muscles, I want to sort of take a little step back because this is going to come up soon. I'm going to go back a couple pages where we first introduced torque. Now, remember, we said that torque is equal to F times R. So if I have an object and I'm rotating about this distance, the further I move out, the bigger R is. And so in order to have the same torque, I can exert a smaller F. But if I have a shorter R, like this, I'm applying my force right here, so R is this distance, then to have the same torque requires a bigger force. It's sort of like that, that first of those two questions that you just answered. Like this requires a bigger force than this. Because my R is bigger here, than it is here. So in order to give the same torque, I need a bigger force here. You follow what I'm saying? That R, when R is small, the, the force is big. Now there's something else that I haven't talked about. I'm going to write this equation a little bit differently. Don't freak out. I'm going to put a trig function here. FR sine theta. What that means is, is that uh, I could write this instead as torque equals F perpendicular R. Don't freak out. Let me, let me explain. What that means is, is that if I apply a force in this direction, I get a certain torque. But if I apply a force in this direction, do I get more, less, or the same torque? That is, applying a force not perpendicular to the moment's arm, but applying a force that's off at an angle. Do I get more, less, or the same torque? What do you think? Uh, no, just settle in on your answer. I'm not saying. I, mean, I appreciate the question, but uh, if I apply a force here perpendicular, I get a certain torque. If I apply a force off at an angle, do I get more, the same force, but at an angle, do I get more, less, or the same torque? Let me ask you another question. Like, you see this door? This door is, is, has a moment on it. I know y'all can't see, and I'm sorry. But if I push on this door, I'm applying a torque, right? What's the best way to open the door? Huh? I'm going to go all the way over here. I'm going to push perpendicular. If I push like this, it's harder to open, right? Y'all have opened doors. 
Or if I try to come over here where r is equal to zero, I can't open it at all because I'm not applying any torque. r equals zero here. If I apply my force at an angle, likewise, I get more, less, or the same torque than if I do like this. I get, I get less. So if I apply my torque at an angle like this, then I get less torque. That's where that sine theta terms in, comes in. Because if I take the sine of an angle, it's always going to be less than, in, less than 1. So if I have a certain angle that's not 90 degrees, that's not perpendicular, then it's going to make my torque smaller. Right, we'll see this in the human body. Like, for example, the muscles, the deltoids that connect to the arm, they have a, a very shallow angle. You know, follow me? And so to lift something like this that's really small requires a lot of force. Are you all aware of this? You all probably know more about this than I do. But it requires a bigger force because I have a really shallow angle. It's like trying to open a door like this. It's harder to open the door. Okay? So there are two things with torques. The length of the moment arm and the angle at which the force is applied. And to get maximum torque, you need to have this force be applied perpendicular to the moment arm. And that's really all we've considered so far. But we'll see that our force can be applied at an angle, and that decreases the amount of our force. Okay, let's try something here. We're going to do a little activity. What I want you to do is to build three different, or you're just going to build two different levers. You're going to take a ruler. You're going to take a rubber band, a 100 gram mass, and when you get the 100 gram mass, you say, hmm, that's 100 grams. No, now I know what 100 grams feels like. And then you're going to take a scale, and then you're going to take some tape, and you're going to be like in groups of three. And you're going to uh, take your, your ruler, and you're going to make a lever. Take some tape off of the roll. Tape it down at the bottom like that. And now look, I got a lever, right? That's a lever. It can either be a what or a what. A what lever can this not be, rather? It can't be a class one. It can't be a teeter-totter, right? Because in order to have a teeter-totter, I have to have my axis of rotation, my fulcrum in the middle, or somewhere in between the effort and resistance. So we're only going to look at class two and three. And so I want you to take your mass and tape it to the end, or tape it to the middle. You're going to do both. Like that. And then you can take your rubber band. And I want you to play around with this and see. This tells you the force required to lift it. And so notice here, I have like 200 grams, uh, but the weight is what mass? 100 grams. So I have twice the force required to lift this because my moment arm is half the length. I have a small moment arm. So I need a bigger force, right? Then you can also put this in the middle and put the scale on the end. And you should see that it takes how many grams of weight to lift this? 50, right, because I get a mechanical advantage of 2. I get require half the force. And then you can also look and see if I hold it off at an angle, and I'd like for you to try this, what happens to the force? And to lift it, gosh, it's like 350 grams. It's quite a bit more when I have it off at an angle. If you go out at a shallow angle, it gets to be even less. Okay, y'all clear with me what you're doing? You're building a class two, a class three lever, comparing the forces required to lift the 100 gram mass. And then I also want you to experiment with sort of what happens when you go off at an angle like this. You with me? Can y'all get into groups of three by yourselves? Okay, we'll do that. And uh, if somebody wants to use this setup, they can. But uh, there's stuff over here. Y'all just come on up and get what you need. Try to spread out a little bit so that you're not bumping up next to one another. Have a mass, scale, ruler, tape. Now you might have to share tape with a nearby group. I have like five or six rolls is all.
All right, folks, uh, start wrapping it up and put your stuff back on the carts. If a class 3 lever requires the most force for effort, and it does, right? The class 3 required the most force. Why in the heck would you even want a class 3 lever? Did I think of that? No, so more, yeah. Well, let's see. Yeah, I think yes. Because you have, like, your axis of rotation, and then your effort, and then your resistance here. So, like, this is a class 3. So you would want a class 3 because your force is exerted over a small distance, but it causes your effort force, but your resistance moves a big distance. Like, for example, this is, as uh, Mariah pointed out, is a class 3 lever, and we'll talk about this. You know, the bicep muscle attaches right about here to your forearm, or maybe even a little closer. It attaches really close to the axis of rotation. So I need a big force in order to move this. Uh, but notice that this point is moving just a very small distance, but my hand, which is, you know, where I would hold the dumbbell or whatever it is that I'm moving, moves a very large distance. So some simple machines don't increase your effort force, or they don't decrease your effort. They don't magnify your effort force. Instead, they actually, you require more effort to lift an object, but it moves the object over a larger distance. A similar type of simple machine is like the bicycle, right? You pedal hard, and it makes you go forward a long distance. That's it's different because it's a different kind of simple machine, but it's similar. Okay? Y'all with me on that? Y'all can identify the levers, sort of do those simple torque things, figuring out the effort and the resistance force. Y'all are amazing. You know that? Amazing. No, I'm serious, actually. Oh, great. Okay, uh, let's look at muscles. I got my wife a couple of years ago. She teaches this astronomy class, and I got her some tights that had, like, you know, star forming regions. And so, have you seen her tights? She doesn't wear them a lot. She wears them like twice a semester. <laughs> but anyway, they're very, they stand out. That's why it seems like she wears them a lot. So, anyway. Uh, but I told her, because when I was looking for those, I also found you can get tights that have all the human muscles on them. And I told her, I should get some of those to wear to class. And she said, no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's look at the muscles. You going to get some of those? Yeah, they're, they're cute, 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 cute. All right, so three types of muscles. Um, I think many of y'all have had anatomy, correct? So you probably know this even better than I do. So if I get anything wrong, then please tell me. Uh, so three types of muscles. There are skeletal muscles. These um, connect to the skeleton. They cause large external movements for the most part. Your book goes into some of these and what they do. Movements. So, for example, you know, your bicep can do this, and your tricep helps you do this kind of motion. Your, uh, what muscle helps you do this? I don't remember. Your what? Yeah, whatever. That muscle. Thank you. Uh, and, <laughs> so thank you, Mark. I, it was a rhetorical question. I didn't know. I didn't really care. <laughs> um, so they cause these large external motions. You also have the, the cardiac muscle. We'll look at the cardiac muscle later, or we'll look at the heart and what it does. But, you know, it's the heart. And then you also have, um, what's the third? Smooth muscles. Right, these are uh, used to move fluids. In fact, I, I just learned this, actually. You guys probably know this, but I was I was wowed by it. That in the esophagus, there are smooth muscles. Are you aware of this? And they sort of have this wavy motion. 
that when you swallow, they, they help the food and the drink or whatever to go down into your stomach. That's a smooth muscle. They help to move fluids in the body. We'll talk about fluids. We have a whole chapter on fluids about this. Mainly we're talking here about the skeletal muscles. Uh, we have two points. We have the insertion point. This is the point that the uh, where the the muscle is attached that causes the bone to move. And then the origin is the end attached to a bone that doesn't move. Uh, sure, I guess. I don't know. Is that what the book says? Is that true? Does your origin ever move? Does it move some? Okay. All right. Yes, thank you, Daisy. All right, so uh, I have this muscle attached up here and attached down here. What is this up here? Is this the origin or the insertion? Origin, right. And down here? Insertion. That's the part that moves. Right. Um, a joint is where two or more bones meet. And a synovial joint allows for large movements. And I have a picture here of a synovial joint. We'll talk about this, the synovial fluid, although I think your book did mention you have this synovial fluid in these joints. And sometimes as we age, that synovial fluid just decreases. And I understand that you can actually take a needle. Some of you told me in a class you take a needle and replace some of that. Do you all know this? Like actually inject into that and improve the amount of cushioning that you get from the synovial fluid. What's that, Daisy? Have you really? Did it hurt? A lot. Yeah, I bet. All right. So um, you also have cartilage. I think there was a quiz question about this. Is it, wasn't there a quiz question? Yes, yeah, so you have cartilage on the ends of the bones. Uh, these are synovial joints. See, on the next page, I have just a picture of the different joints. Mainly, we're going to be concerned with, you know, the uh, the hinge joint, like on the elbow and in the leg, right here. Uh, our ball and socket joints are also fairly important because, especially, look at the range of motion that you get on the ball and socket joint. You get a range of motion in all three directions, and that I like can all the x, y, and the z directions. So that allows for a lot of flexibility in how we move. Uh, the shoulder is also considered to be a ball and socket, though it's not really a true ball and socket like the hip is, you know this, because the shoulder is really just sort of like this, whereas the hip is like this. It's actually more of a true ball and socket. But the shoulder is really sort of a ball up against a flat plate, as I understand it. And that's why the shoulder is more prone to injury than, say, the hip is. And also because you have your shoulder, right, which is just, like this bone up next to a flat place is all held together with ligaments and muscles, and you have gravity that pulls down on your arm and can is always pulling down on this joint. So whereas with the, the hip, you have gravity that's sort of forcing it up into place. So you're more prone to shoulder injuries than you are hip injuries. Uh, let's see. I think that's – we'll talk about some of these different motions – about like the sliding motion that we have, say like in the uh, the foot bones, and also the rotational motion like we have in the, the neck with the pivot as you can move your head from side to side. So you'll need to know those three different types of motion, that hinge motion, the sliding motion, it'll come up soon in your notes, and then also uh, the, the rotational motion like this. Probably telling you, what many of you already know. Then uh, we talked about tension a day or so, uh, a class or so ago, and we said that that tension, if I apply tension into a string, then what, say I pull on this side with 10 newtons, 
But I also, because of Newton's third law, I'm going to have an equal and opposite force that's also 10 newtons. And that the tension in the string is likewise going to be 10 newtons. So whatever force is applied on a string or a muscle or a ligament uh, will be the same throughout. So the tension force is the same all along the muscle. And again, like I said, if I have, say, a rope and I apply a force of 10 newtons, then I'm also going to get 10 newtons over here. And I'll get 10 newtons of tension all throughout that object. We have a couple of different contractions we talk about in the body. The isotonic contraction. Uh, this is a contraction of the muscle that causes the bone to move. And then the isometric contraction uh, does not cause the bone to move. All right. Look at this. Oh, what is this? Which one is this? My muscles, they're all contracted right now because I'm holding this chair. Which one is it? Is it isotonic or isometric? It's a, is it moving? It's not moving, right. So that isometric, that it doesn't cause motion. But I can have my muscles tensed, right? I can, they can be contracted but not causing motion. Whereas, you know, this, I'm actually moving. The bones are moving. The object's moving. All right, so that would be an isotonic. Isotonic causes motion. Isometric does not cause motion. As I said, we also have three types of movement. We saw this in the previous figure with all the different joints. And the different joints allow for this different type of movement. The gliding, like in the foot and hands. Um, you have two flat bone surfaces that slide. Uh, you like like in the foot, hand, etc. I don't know if there's any gliding motion elsewhere. Is there gliding motion elsewhere outside of the foot and hand? I don't know. If you let it trainers, you know. Are you about to tell me, Taylor? What if I do this? Is your knee, oh, your, like your kneecap? Your hand shot. I don't know. I, I'm not sure that there are. Um, okay, and the angular, uh, the angle between the movable and the immovable bones chains, changes. Remember, the movable is the insertion point, and the immovable, or as y'all pointed out, it moves a little bit, but not very much. That would be, gosh, what is that called? That or that point origin, right? Between the movable and the immovable bones will change. So it's as you think, right, with this, with your knee, and then rotation. bone twists along its long axis. So this is like your head rotating, right, like this. I have all these different joints that allow my body to move in all these different directions. Okay, let's look at uh, classes of levers in the body. Uh, we'll just do this. We'll look at it in, in terms, we already covered levers. So let's look at it in terms of the human body. And we'll try this clicker question, the one on the left first. And start this. I'll zoom in for those of you who don't have your book yet. What type of lever are they in order from left to right? So this first one, this figure is also in your book. But uh, this is the force of the muscle. This is the weight of the head. This is your fulcrum. 
fulcrum, force of the muscle, weight of the head, fulcrum, uh, weight of your body. This is doing this. Force of the muscle of your calves. If we what type of lever are these in order from left to right? Feel free to ask your neighbor if you're not sure. Many of you have the right answer, but some of you do not. Okay. Stop at uh, 115, 115. Okay, good. B is right. Right. This first one is a first class lever. You know, it's like a teeter totter. Right. Uh, this next one, I know it either has to be a second or a third because my axis of rotation is down here. So um, it's a third class lever. I can think about, about this because, you know, my effort force is here, my resistance force is here. In a third class lever, I require a bigger effort in order to lift my resistance. And that's the case here for the bicep. And then this one is a second class lever. Uh, again, the axis of rotation is here, but my effort force is less than my resistance force because of the way they're situated. OK? Be able to identify the different types of levers. Be able to identify the different types of levers in the human body and as they're, as they're situated there. Uh, now let's try this next one, the deltoid muscle. You know, like right here, it exerts a very large force to lift the arm like this. Which of these is the best explanation? I'm going to tell you the answer. It's a little misleading here, I think. Maybe it's just not well worded. Is the deltoid a small muscle? No, it's pretty big muscle, right? Like in the big scheme, this thing right here, that's a pretty big muscle, am I right? Big muscle. The torque of the deltoid is very small. This is a true statement. Why is the torque of the deltoid very small? Is it because the lever arm, the value for R is small? Not really, right? Because it comes down and it maybe connects right about here. That lever arm is, is not terribly small compared to the length of the, the forearm or the, uh, what's this called, the upper arm. Okay, so the lever arm isn't terribly small. It's really the torque of the deltoid is very small. Why is the torque very small? What does it have to do with? It's not the lever arm, it's the what? What is it? Remember the door? With the door over here, we said that if I push like this, I can open it. This is sort of the optimal way. But if I push like this with, a, with an angle that is shallow, then that causes me to have a very small torque. And that's why it's difficult to open the door. All right? I know you all are going to be trying to open doors like this all day today, aren't you? And people are going to look at you like, what are you doing? Okay. But it's the same with the deltoid, that the angle here is very small when that causes the torque to also be very small. Okay? To get maximum torque, the force should be perpendicular. But when it's at an angle like this, a very shallow angle, then that causes our torque to be very small. So if you haven't put it yet, go ahead and put uh, B. The answer is B. If I put in B, it's still running, so you can change your answer. I'm going to stop at uh, 245. Go ahead and put B. I'm going to look at a couple of examples. Oh, look at that. Man. Amazing. No joke, though. I gave you the answer. All right. 
let's look at a couple of examples. So here, what is the force in the bicep to hold the forearm up? I want you to estimate the weight of the forearm. And then what is the force when it's holding a 5 kilogram mass? So if you want to do it in pounds, that's fine. But I want you to think about what is, you know, we can do it in pounds. And a 5 kilogram mass, that's about, you know, 10 pounds or so. So what is the force for us to hold our bicep up if I'm holding, say, a 10 pound weight? And then also, I want you to consider what is the weight of the forearm, all right? And then figure out what is the force in our bicep that's required to hold that whole thing up. So take a minute. The first thing you need to do is say, well, the, the forearm has a weight of probably, I don't know, blah. And then I want you to draw a sketch, include the axis of rotation, the moment arm, and then you have two forces that are at work there. You have the weight of the dumbbell, and then you have the weight of the forearm. The weight of the forearm is going to be right about here. We'll talk about why that is soon. And then I want you to figure out what is the force of the bicep required to hold that up. Uh -huh. All right, just a minute or so, you want to estimate the weight of the forearm, and then I want you to draw a diagram that labels those two forces, the weight of the forearm, the weight of the dumbbell, draw them as vectors, arrows, pointing in the downward direction. And then think about what is the force of the bicep, so that'll be a third force at play. And then what is then the force in the bicep required to hold this 10-pound weight? I'll give you another minute or so and I'll jump in, but think about it for a bit. What do y'all think the weight of the forearm is, roughly? You might know right off. Hey, you know that? Are you just guessing? <laughs> Eight pounds? Yeah. All right, we'll just call it 10. Okay, I think that's about right. What did you say? Two pounds. Maybe if you have puny little arms, you have two pounds. <laughs> All right, so we'll say a 10-pound forearm. Uh, and then... We said a five kilogram mass, we'll just call it, that's about 10 pounds, okay? Not not quite, but almost. So where am I going to write those vectors? The dumbbell will be where? All the way to the end. So this is the force of the dumbbell. We'll say that it's 10 pounds. And then the weight of the forearm. This is going to be the weight of the forearm. This is also 10 pounds. All right, so now, what is the force that's required right over here? This is the force of the bicep. This is the insertion point right here. So this bicep, it connects right about here to my forearm and causes it to move in this direction. So if I'm holding it like this, where the force of the bicep is 90 degrees, then what is that force? Well, we need to know what is this length? What is this length, roughly? Feet, meters, whatever you want to do is fine. How far is this? From here all the way out to here. Come on. Okay. What is it? 0.5 meters? 
Uh, it's probably about a foot and a half, is that what you said? Yeah, it's about maybe 18 inches. We'll say it's 18 inches. And so this distance, let's say, is 18 inches. We'll say that this distance is 9 inches. But what is this distance? The distance where from the axis of rotation at your joint to the uh, insertion point where the muscles are actually attached to the bone. It's not that much. It's really just a few centimeters. We'll say a couple of inches just to make the math easier. All right. So let's say that this distance right here to the insertion point is about two inches. It's actually less than that. All right. So now I want to figure out what is the force of the bicep. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set my torques equal to one another. So I have some torques that are causing it to move in one direction. That's your bicep. And then I have other torques that are causing it to move in the other direction. That's the weight of the dumbbell, the weight of the arm. So I say the force of the bicep times the distance r, which is, you know, 2 inches, we'll say, is equal to the weight of the forearm, that's 10 pounds, times what distance? What is the moment arm for the weight of the forearm? Are y'all completely lost? Okay, let me just sort of step back. Remember, we did this. This is a similar problem to what we had done before. Where we said I have a force over here and a force over here. I have some value R here and some value R here. And the way I figured out what one force is, is I would say this force times this distance is equal to this force times this distance. We're doing the exact same problem here. Except I have on one side just one force, and also I'm dealing with a class 3 lever instead of a class 1. I have one force that's causing motion in this direction, so we're going counterclockwise. And then I have two forces that are causing motion in the opposite direction. So I'm doing the exact same problem we've done up here, where I say F times R equals F times R. But now, I'm going to have one force, F times R, is equal to this force times the axis of rotation, the, the moment on this distance right here. It's going to be 9 inches. With me? I know we're almost done. Y'all getting tired. We just have a few minutes left. But so I'm going to have 10 pounds times 9 inches. That's the weight of the forearm. Plus 10 pounds times what distance? 18 inches. Now, these are funky units. These are inch pounds, which isn't really something we use very often, but it's still okay. Now, I can solve this for the force of the bicep. This is 90 plus 180. That's 270 inch pounds divided by 2. All right, 2 inches. The inches cancel out. And to lift that 10-pound dumbbell, we need, what's that? Oh, 135 pounds of force. To lift that 10-pound dumbbell, just estimating here, making some estimates about the weight of your forearm and the like, we need 135 pounds of force. Wow. Isn't that amazing? We should all be walking around like biceps like Arnold Schwarzenegger out to here, don't you think? Because it's a class 3 lever, folks. And class 3 levers are really terrible at mechanical advantage. All right. We will stop there, and we'll finish up this chapter and begin on Chapter 2 on Thursday. Listen, if you need to see me tomorrow, unfortunately, I'm not available. So I'm out all day tomorrow. But uh, I'll be checking email, so if you have any questions, just shoot me an email. Y'all have an awesome day. We'll see you Thursday.